finally happen. And I know that I should just refer to this book that is your perfect job that is I've been told with many people that is the best in its field about the explanation how happened in Iran and Islamic Revolution on that time and I had a chance to read it and it's really good and my question is mostly referring to your book and your job. As the very first question, I like to ask you, you just described the Shah as a monarch with decades of experience, billions of dollars, and the largest military in the region. And then you ask, how could such a regime fall? What is your answer to this question? First of all, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak with you. Oh, thank you. I'm very pleased to be able to meet you and to have this interview. And it's an honor to be asked questions about a book that, honestly, I wasn't sure anybody would ever read. Oh, no. <laughs> no, that's your book is well known. You're very kind. So the question has to do with this powerful regime a regime that was seemingly stable, that had all of these resources at its command, including a leader who had weathered many storms and survived many difficulties, oil money, billions of dollars every year, a huge military, a huge security apparatus. How could such a regime fall to a popular movement that had very little in the way of resources, that had very few guns and weapons. Within several months, the Shah went from being a powerful force, not just in Iran, but in the region, to being powerless and having to run away from his own country. I think it's a fascinating question, not just for Iranian history and for the Iranian people, but for the world. How does the regime topple so quickly? And I think the answer has to be that regimes are never as strong as they appear because they require obedience. They require people to, uh, to, to play along, to go along with the institutions of government. No regime can repress everybody all the time. There simply are not enough police, there's not enough soldiers, there's not enough detention centers to arrest everybody all at once. And when people start to disobey in large, large numbers, it's like, it's like a run on the bank. The bank is not set up for everybody to request their money all at once. Similarly, security forces are not set up to repress everybody all at once. So if you have a run on the reserves of coercion, just as a bank can fail, a regime can fail too. And I think that's what we saw in the fall of 1978, is a run on the reserves of coercion. That the regime was very active in trying to put down the various protests, the various strikes as they occurred. But whenever they sent a military uh, detachment into uh, a factory or into a refinery in the oil industry or into an electrical substation to get the things moving again they would work and yet the the second they left the people would go back on strike they simply did not have enough people to repress everybody all at once so you are saying that there is no enough resources ever when the people don't want to obey. Yes, mass disobedience can only be repressed selectively. They can shoot into a crowd, and in fact they did. they did. Not as much as they might have, but certainly there were a number of fatalities. We actually have a listing of the numbers of people who died 
during the revolution. It's very interesting. It was produced in the sociology department at the University of Tehran as a master's thesis by a student who had access to the records of the Martyrs Foundation mm -hmm. and of the cemetery, Behesh de Zahra, yes. and from the, uh, the um, uh, morgue at the hospitals, the main hospitals. And he tallied up the number of people killed by the regime during the revolution. And it turns out it was less than a thousand people in Tehran only. Now, of course, around the country the number must have gone higher, but in Tehran, less than a thousand people were killed. So when they talk about uh, Black Friday and these horrible events, and they were horrible events, we're not talking about thousands and thousands of people dying. It's more hundreds. And yet, people were scared. If you went out into a demonstration, people were very much afraid. So the fear wasn't gone, but the confidence, the sense of inevitability, the sense of making history, of being part of history, overweighed the fear. And from the interviews that I've conducted, and I hope that your own personal experience confirms this, people had a sense that, yes, I might get targeted, I might be injured, I might be arrested, I might be killed, but look at all these people joining me. Look how many others are willing to risk their lives. I want to be a part of this. And my sense is that once that mental shift occurs... The better tomorrow it was the main goal for us as the student at the time to make for the country. And I can say that is was for everybody that participating in that protesting. My next question is referring to your book as well, that you are saying in the book that the protesters took the Shah's regime down in just a hundred days. But as I remember, the demonstration actually started almost a year before the Shah's fall. Why you are so focused on the last hundred days of the Shah's regime? Something changed in those last hundred days. In the fall of 1978, yes, there had been protests, of course, prior to that time, for months and months. And if you go back further, for years and years, there were long-standing protest movements in opposition to the Shah's regime. But they were small. They were contained. So even in the, by the, the summer of 1978, the demonstrations and the protests that were occurring were a few thousand people at most here and there. There start to be mass protests, mass demonstrations, and mass general strikes only in September and October of 1978. And that's when you see an unprecedented level of opposition, open opposition to the Shah. And between that point and the departure of the Shah from Iran is only a hundred days. And it was at that time that the Shah went from dealing with small protests and being still very much in charge of the agenda of the country to being set back, unable to govern, unable to respond to this mass outpouring of opposition, and ultimately leave it with, as you know, a caretaker government that wasn't able to survive much more than a month itself. Yeah, that's true. You mentioned in your book that in October 1978, the State Department here, State Department of Shell, were startled to hear a debate whether political events in Iran could be likened more to an avalanche or to a raging forest fire. What about now? I am confused. Obama's administration is trying to be silent about the green movement in Iran. Is this because of another confusion is going on in the US government about Iranians? Or is a sign of the government trying to be too smart 
but not taking side on this very sensitive subject, I can say. Let me start to answer your question by going back to 1978 and discussing for a moment the debates that occurred among observers of Iran. American diplomats, <clears throat> social scientists from around the world, and of course Iranian experts themselves, all of whom were startled to see this mass movement emerge. Because most observers thought that the Shah was very much in power and that he was making major changes and perhaps creating enemies within Iran, but had the power to push forward and to, to, to keep the enemies off balance. They were very surprised to see this mass movement emerge, and so they wondered where it was headed. I think that sense of surprise, that sense of uncertainty, occurs whenever a major political protest emerges, that these are always surprising events. Because the routine, the easy path, the path of least resistance, is almost always to continue what's gone before. The institutions generally survive. When you go off those tracks, when people start to do something different, it's startling. It, it is, it's a, a emotionally wrenching. Whether you're in favor it, of it or against it, it's emotionally attention-grabbing. I think that was uh, a sign in 1978 that the American government, like the Iranian government, was trying to wrap its head around these new occurrences, these very unpredictable shifts of public opinion and public behavior. Now if we fast forward more than 30 years to the Green Movement of the last year, I think we see a very similar situation. Up to the elections, the presidential elections in 2009 in Iran, people were, of course, unsure how these elections would turn out, who was going to win. And there were all sorts of estimates and analyses about which side would have the greater turnout, which side would get more votes. But I think almost everybody expected that the institutions of the regime would remain, regardless of who won the presidency. Within the days after the disputed election, when we see a mass demonstration, mass expression of opposition, of protest, everybody was surprised once again. And suddenly it looked as though these institutions might not survive. Now the US government and the Obama administration was, of course, I think, as surprised as everybody else that the protest movement, the Green Movement, it was as widespread as it was. And so there was, I gather, an internal debate. How should we respond? And very quickly, and I don't know who took which position, but very quickly the Obama administration decided we cannot intervene. We cannot be perceived as intervening. And my sense is they were responding to requests from the Green Movement itself. That the Obama administration was, uh, was being told by leaders of the Green Movement, please, don't, uh, don't tell us how, how, how much you support us. Don't hurt us. <laughs> don't hurt us by embracing us. Yes. And so the Obama administration issued these very carefully worded statements. We support the rights of the Iranian people. We support human rights everywhere and oppose repression everywhere. But this is for Iranians to decide, not for Americans to decide. The future, the political future of Iran is for Iranians to decide. And they stayed with that position pretty consistently, with the only exception being the American uh, intervention on uh, the issue of the Iranian nuclear energy and nuclear weapons. And I think that, that this was a sophisticated position on the part of the Obama administration. That it was a response to, it was listening to the people who they wanted to help. 
and asking them, what can we do to help you? And they said, do nothing. That's and the Obama impressive. administration, which I think for any American presidency, it's difficult <clears throat> to do nothing. They want to appear active. And to do nothing takes a large amount of restraint. And Obama got a lot of criticism among Americans who wanted more forceful support for the, the, the opposition in Iran. And yet, if the Iranian opposition is saying, please, stand back, let us take care of this, then I think that was the appropriate thing for the Obama administration to do. Okay, how do you see the green movement in Iran? What direction it is heading to? Is it going to make another surprise for the U.S. and the world? Can you see the green movement five years from now? Well, my position in the book, The Unthinkable Revolution in Iran, is that revolutions are unpredictable. So if I make a prediction, it would undermine the, deep, the, the conclusions of the book. So let me predict that the current regime will maintain itself. That that's usually the best bet. Stasis, the lack of change, is usually the best bet. Now that way, if a revolution occurs and I'm wrong, then that proves my book right. That way I win either way. But I see the Green Movement as being a mass movement. I see it as tapping into very widespread disenchantment and disillusionment with the Islamic Republic. But it's not a unanimous country. Iran is a country that's very divided, deeply divided, and there are large constituencies that support the Islamic Republic in its current form. And I think that any reform movements that emerge, or any revolutionary attempts to change the constitution in Iran, are going to be met with serious opposition. That this is going to, it's not an easy fix or an easy solution. If you look at survey results, of course surveys in a repressive atmosphere cannot be trusted entirely. But even granting that, survey results over the last year suggest that there are significant constituencies on both sides, perhaps one-third in favor of reformists, one-third that seems to support the current regime, and a third that may be swing voters, undecided or not politically engaged. Neither side, I think, wants to give way. So I think we are bound to see more protest, more hostility, more conflict for the foreseeable future. I want to refer to the, a little bit to the history of the U.S.-Iran relationship. Mm -hmm. There is a very bad memory in Iranians' mind about the USA. USA roles in overthrowing Mossad government. This is going to be a major issue in the time of the normalization between these two countries. No matter who is in power, one third that you mentioned or the other one. Or I can say a reformist or a hardliner in the office. What do you suggest to Obama's administration if it's going to happen, the normalization, or stepping forward toward the normalization between these two countries? As you say, the U.S. has intervened in Iran, not just at that time, but in ongoing support for various uh, 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 governments, repressive governments in Iranian history. Uh, and the uh, only way to transcend this history is to apologize and to promise not to repeat these sorts of interventions. At the same time, let's remember that the coup against Mossadegh was conducted largely by Iranians. The CIA's own history, the internal history of the uh, attempted coup, shows that the CIA failed. They were moving their assets out of the country when they heard that some freelancers, people they'd worked with, were taking over the radio station and 
uh, were, were conducting the coup without them. And so they brought their people back and uh, worked with uh, these freelancers to put the Shah back on the throne. The CIA was not omnipotent and all-powerful. However, the, the, the fact remains that the U.S. attempted to overthrow a legitimate government in Iran. Now, there have been various apologies by the U.S. government since then, beginning in the Clinton administration, and I think that's a start. This is a problem the United States has in its dealings with many countries around the world. The world superpower uses its power, and that uh, is not something people around the world are, are happy about. And yet, I think moving forward, there's much to be gained by better relations between Iran and the U.S. And when a government is in power in Iran that wants to reap these rewards and make these gains, I don't think they'll let history stand in the way. The problem now, it seems to me, on the Iranian side, is that the hardliners gain more by isolation, or feel they gain more by isolation, than they gain by engagement. So it's in their political interest to maintain their Iran's isolation and the hostility against the United States. The reformists are afraid of being uh, called soft on the great Satan. And there's been this repeated pattern since uh, Prime Minister Bozargan was in office. Of any time there's a rapprochement with the United States, a crisis comes up in Iran to make them look bad, to make the reformists look like they're agents of imperialism. And they stop and they give up. I think that's the, the recurrent pattern within Iran. Now within the United States as well, there's very little to be gained politically by engagement with Iran. Because the Iranian-American community is not wholeheartedly in favor of restoration with, of relations with the Islamic Republic. And there are very few other constituencies in the United States political scene that want to gain something by restoring relations with Iran. Interestingly, one of those constituencies are American oil companies who would like to make money on the Iranian market, of, mm -hmm. course. of course. And they've lobbied for years to get better relations with Iran. Unsuccessfully. In the United States, we think oil companies rule the world. We think that they're all powerful politically. And yet, even under the Bush administration, which had such close ties to the oil industry, they were not able to make any headway in improving relations to get access to the Iranian oil market. But there is a theory that says that whenever the tension is too high between these two countries, the oil price is usually high so that they are going to make the money that they need it without even... I'm sure they have calculations <laughs> both, both ways, <laughs> Yes. Uh, the scenarios on both sides. But if you look back over the last 15, 20 years, uh, oil companies were among the strongest voices in favor of normalizing relations with Iran. And the very last questions, what do you think about the attack on Iran? Because these days we hear such a, these news from this corner or another, they are talking and some people saying that the sanctions, the new sanction is the very beginning of that process. Are we heading toward this direction again? Well, I hope not. I have no classified information about this. But my sense from reading press reports is that the strongest opponent of an American military attack on Iran is the American military itself. That the military leadership does not want to have heightened tensions, does not want military uh, catastrophe. They have enough on their hands yeah. already. Another war is not what they want. And we've seen statements by various military leaders 
saying, of course, the president will decide and all options have to be on the table, yeah. which is how they always talk about foreign policy. However, we do not want to see tensions rising uh, and a possible conflict with Iran. We've, there have been various incidents over the last several years. Perhaps you remember one where Iranian uh, military speedboats came near a U.S. Yeah. warship in the Persian Gulf. The military leaders in the U.S. were very quick to say, we did not escalate. We did not fire on them, and we did not want to have a confrontation. It was interesting to see that the military leaders were less warlike than some of the civilian leaders civilian. in the United States. My sense is that the professionals in the military know that a conflict with Iran cannot end well. We do not want to take over another country. We do not want war in the Persian Gulf, where the oil comes, so much of the world's oil comes through, that they are going to do everything they can to avoid a conflict. Uh, whether they succeed, I don't know. It seems as though there are uh, political reasons on both the Iranian and the American side for sounding warlike and sounding strong in advance of whatever negotiations might take place, or even in the absence of negotiations, perhaps. But I'm hoping that the professionals in the militaries on both sides will realize that nothing to, is to be gained by an actual conflict. Hopes. I know you uh, speak Farsi very well. I like to say, متشکرم از وقتی که در اختیار من و 